Daniel in Tennessee. Sounds good to me. Daniel, you're live with Eric and V. What would you like to talk about today? Hi, so um, I'd like to talk about the, the moral argument for the existence of God. Oh, yay. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. So uh, what... Okay. Uh, what about the moral argument? Actually, let's present it for, for everybody watching so we can all kind of go along together. Okay. Um, first off, I'm kind of a fan of this, this show. I'm Ooh. kind of a theist on the edge of atheism, kind of feel Ooh. like. If you but have a, if you're your own YouTube show, Theist on the Edge is a good name. <laughs> go for it. Actually, yeah, that's not bad. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, I just, just appreciate you all and uh, everything. Uh, but so, so the the moral argument, um, if a God does not exist, uh, objective moral values do not exist. Um, second, um, objective moral values do exist, so a God exists. Right. So I, I think so, that um, the first place to go there would be to determine whether or not objective moral values exist. Okay. Right. right. And um, so, so I think that that we all have this 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 kind of intuition about like well, what is right and what is wrong, which may or may not be different from morality. But um, I think that we have this intuition, and also we can kind of use the Bible. I know. The, the Bible is not perfect, and kind of the more I look into it, the more I see that it's nowhere near perfect as what I thought it was. But I believe that that can also be used as a tool um, alongside our intuition. So, so I, I the, the idea of intuition being some kind of you know nebulous Jiminy Cricket is something that um, I actually thought for a while before I really started trying to look into the biology of it. Um, when I first when I first came across it, um, my, my thought was kind of where you are. And then eventually I wound up turning it on its ear a little bit and going, okay, it's not whether or not we are moral because we behave in a way that we, we say is moral or we try to behave in moral ways. It's why do we do it? So we already behave in moral ways, or at least we try to. Why do we do it? So we're talking about objectives right. here, right? What in your definition right. is an objective moral? Because depending on your definition, we might agree with you. Okay. So do you want like an example of an objective moral or Well, I mean, it, if, you, if you have a definition, that would be best. If you don't, then we can try and, and ferret one out, you know, with an example. Okay. Um, objective moral. Um, I don't know if I'm actually prepared to give a definition, but um, let's just take do, um, kill, uh, killing someone um, as an example. C could we do that? Or, or anything else? It doesn't matter. Yeah, I, you know, um, I, I think killing. We let's let's dive down a little bit more to find something we can all agree with. Because I'm sure killing to save your family would be okay. Um, you know, killing to survive or or, or killing you know, some some kind of mon like let's let's say indiscriminately killing for fun um, with no ben no no actual societal benefit. Let's go. Okay. Let's go okay, real, agree. real deep here, <laughs> um, and very okay. specific. Totally um, agree. Okay, good. We're we're, we're all yeah. Okay. okay. So we can all agree that that's bad. That that is immoral, right? Right. Um, what makes what what would be the difference between it being objectively immoral and just subjectively immoral? Um, so I think, um, if we use like this principle, like if the, the majority or if the overwhelming majority of, of a population of, of a culture, a specific culture agree 
on on something, then we can put that as like a um, as an objective moral. I know Richard Dawkins. I have been reading some of his books, which are very interesting. Um, I think he uses the, the term moral zeitgeist, um, and and I believe that does move. But I believe that, that that's still an objective example that we can use, like some sort of the majority of the population of a certain culture. So all of those, I, I'm, I'm with you well, so far. I mean, I mean, but we're still in subjective. I'm still trying to determine what the difference is between objective and subjective morals. Right. Because I think you are more aligning with what we think, which is that we determine what objective morality is based on the objective. I know a lot of theists wouldn't agree with you on that. And they'd say there's some kind of higher objective morality that exists outside of us somehow that determines what is actually objectively moral or immoral. Is that where you're coming from? Or are you more along the lines of, well, right. yeah. Right. Yes. So, so yeah, I believe that it does come from, from, God or this intuition, but I believe that we all kind of agree on it because, um, okay. um, yeah. So my question then Not becomes the Bible, but like in Rome. Oh, sorry. No, no you're fine. You're fine. Go ahead. Right, go ahead. Oh, um, um, <laughs> well, okay. Call her first and then. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm so sorry. Um, so, um, I am in Romans I know it, it says you know that God has written the that the law on our hearts so, I, so I believe we can kind of use that too Okay so my question then becomes how do we determine how do we differentiate between an objective morality that is written on our hearts and a sufficiently agreed upon subjective reality that everyone just agreed upon without that objective input And, and just just to kind of help right. help move that a little bit, to um, there are a lot of things that point toward the second one. One of those things being that we're hardwired as social creatures to behave in a very specific way. I mean, we, we are animals. You know, if if we weren't a social species, then a lot of the things that we would consider immoral, I think, wouldn't be the case. But since we are a social species. We put value on protecting and nourishing and growing the species at large. You know, you have you have edge cases that we can talk about, but the general push for humanity is to flourish. You know, you, you don't need that outside source. Okay. Okay. I agree with part of the second half of what you said, Eric. Um I believe, um, you know, I guess it is kind of hard to define um, objective moral, but but um, overall, I believe it. We have to go basically on the what partially the Bible says, but also um, on, um, like I said, what what um, is written on our hearts or like our intuition, but. I don't know how that can be. I think that that is what I've been calling a, a objective. Okay. Mm -hmm. So can I ask you a question moving off of this, okay. uh, onto this uh, concept of using both the Bible and your intuition or this shared objective quote unquote reality that we all live in. Um, if the Bible tells you to do one thing and your intuition tells you to do something else or that that thing is wrong. How do you make that distinction? Because the Bible commands some people to do some really awful things. So I'm assuming that you wouldn't kill your child because God told you to or commit genocide or any of these things um, because I think you're a good person. Right. But my question right. then becomes if you're using both of these, then how do you determine what to do when they come into conflict. Okay. Um, I, I guess you would have 
to, I, I guess, go off of what your intuition is telling you. But then, so so I guess, um, yeah, I guess I would say you have to go on your intuition. I mean, if if it's if the Bible tells you to kill your firstborn or whatever, um, in, in Abraham's case, I would not have done that. I mean, or if I, so. So I guess to wrap this up and then I'll let Eric take this where he needs to take this. But um, I would ask then if you're going to run with your intuition and if your intuition is more in line with these objective morals uh, that the rest of society agrees on, why do you need the Bible? Yeah. And um, just to kind of give a, a, a short example about the other side, because th there is the idea that, um, and I've talked to plenty of apologists who said that uh, objective morality is that which comports to the nature of God. And so if you're doing something that reflects God's nature, you're doing something objectively moral. And I explored that for a while. I actually, as a Christian, one of the first real big problems I had was in this this static perfection. And I I'm, I'm, promise I'm not going way off, um, <laughs> but uh, follow me here for just a second. Um, I asked okay. my pastor, uh, if God has, I don't know, his hand a certain way, um, does that mean that that is the perfect way to hold your hand? My, my pastor said, yes. I said, okay, so if he moves at all, he's then imperfect because... You know, so, so God is just like a statue. And he said, no, 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 God moves. And I said, okay, but then how is that? Well, does it stop being perfect when he moves his hand? He goes, yeah. I said, why? And he said, because perfection follows God. Right? So if you were to, and again, this might be way niche, way edge case, but um, I've heard it enough that I feel like it's worth sharing. And that is that if perfection follows God, if you come across that, then it's just God's subjective <laughs> uh, place. You're still not out of the woods. Um, mm. You just you just kick the can down the road. So, anyway, I hope that helps. Right. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that does. More to think about. Okay, thank you all. This is so much for taking my call. Of course, Absolutely. call back in once you've thought a little bit about it, and we'll we'll have some more conversation. Yeah. You, you you sounded a little nervous, Thank but you, you did great, man. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. You're good. <laughs> okay. Beast oh. on the edge. I like that. Someone should run with that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs>